Hi everyone, I'm Overthink Podcast co-host Ellie Anderson. And um, your co-host, David Peña Guzman. Uh, you might know us already from our channel here where we often do lectures and also from the podcast Overthink, which you can get wherever you listen. <laughs> uh, spot- to your podcasts, <laughs> wherever you listen to your YouTubes. <laughs> Apple, Spotify, <laughs> YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, we're here today because we want to have a little reading group about... Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Fifth Reverie. Um, So we're just going to chat a little bit about it. You can feel free to follow along by reading it yourself. We are, yeah, working with the fifth walk. So this is from Rousseau's Reveries of the Solitary Walker. And one of the things that I really like about the fifth walk, I love teaching the reveries just in general, especially in spring semester. Students really like it in spring semester. Do you assign them to go on walks? As part of the class? Uh, no, but I but I did once teach this text while outside, which was really epic. Okay. Um, but one of the things that I really like about the fifth walk is that here, Rousseau articulates a, an, a view of happiness that's really, I think, like quite worth mulling over because it's very different from the idea that we might have that happiness is an intense state or a fleeting feeling. So maybe I'll set the scene a little bit for yeah, yeah, for yeah. the viewers. So Rousseau in this walk is describing a couple of months in which he lived on this island called Ile Saint-Pierre in Switzerland. Now, the circumstances under which he found himself living on this island were quite suboptimal. <laughs> he was stoned, or his house was stoned, um, in Motier, the village of Motier, and so he had to flee Motier and ended up on this island. But what he yes. found was that while living on this island, I, the Ile Saint Pierre, um, which was known by the people of Neuchâtel as the Ile de la Motte, was this like particular kind of peacefulness that he says he has never known in his life before or since. Tell us a little bit about this kind of peacefulness, David. What, what do you think about what Rousseau is saying here? Yeah, so the, the fifth walk is a, a, is a meandering <laughs> reflection on... I mean, that's a, a reveries. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, of, of a kind of calmness and repose that is made possible when you combine the right kind of space, the right kind of environment with the right kind of mental attitude. Mm. Um, at least that's how I'm, I'm reading this piece because he talks about happiness, again, not as this intense joy or as something that you attain through the satisfaction of a desire that then gets reignited okay. once the object of desire is missed, but as a state of being that you achieve um, almost through the small pleasures of life, yeah. uh, through being in a place... Um, that is conducive to what he sometimes describes in terms of like a slow but constant flow mm -hmm. um, of time. So Absolutely. again, it's different to to the image of like a peak of happiness. Yeah. Um, it, it gives you more of a sense of a stream. Yeah. That flows constantly but slowly, and makes. I, if I were to visualize this, I think of like a stream that just says. Mm -hmm. That is his conception of happiness here. Yeah, so here's, for instance, a, one of the descriptions that he has of it. What page are you on? Um, page, bottom of 86, top of 87. Okay. He writes, the ebb and flow of the water, its continuous yet undulating noise, kept lapping against my ears and my eyes, taking the place of all the inward movements which my reverie had calmed within me. And it was enough to make me pleasurably aware of my existence without troubling myself with thought. So I would actually say you you talked about a combination of the setting and an inward calm. I would say it's the setting that's causing the inward calm for him. And then here on the next page, page 88, he talks about this lasting state of happiness. OK, so here he says that like, Everything on earth is in constant flux. And so to that extent, our earthly joys are all fleeting, right? And so we don't want to hold to, and we don't want to aspire to this state of joy because that's going to pass away. Instead, there's a state of the soul, which is a state of rest. And he says, if there's a state of the soul, or if there's a state where the soul can find a resting place secure enough to establish itself and concentrate its entire being there, 
with no need to remember the past or reach into the future where time is nothing to it. So really interesting, this idea of, oh, of being yeah. out of time, right? Not the fleeting present, yes, but yes, this like yes. being out of time. And then he says that this is a simple feeling of existence and it's this kind of lasting state, right? A single mm -hmm. lasting state rather than moments of intense joy and passion. Yeah, and, and so that quieting down of the passions and of the sense of, of the self as being in flux because of the inherent movement of the world, whether that's the natural world or the social world, he says, what I envision as an alternative must not be confused with utter passivity. At yeah. some point, he makes some points about silence that are really interesting, where mm -hmm. he says, absolute silence. So thinking here about the the... the the real shutting down of all sensibility of all the faculties of the mind. Yeah, we do have a silence podcast episode if you haven't listened yet. Yes, and he says uh, a complete silence would be an image of death. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so there has to be still some engine of movement that keeps the self activated. Yeah. Um, and, and so the question is what that engine of movement is. Is it just like the inherent temporality of the self, the fact that the self moves through time? Is it maybe a form of faint thinking that is different than the more active thought that okay. we have normally? I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, you're right that it requires some motion, but is relatively tranquil for him. Mm -hmm. So I think there are maybe a couple of ways that we could answer your question just now, which is like, what is the engine of that? One might be the very feeling of existence itself. Right? Because he It is he internal. Talks. He does say it comes from within. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he talks in multiple places about the simple feeling of existence. So I think the feeling of existence wouldn't be just like this entirely passive thing because you feel powerful when you feel like you exist, but it's also not directly goal oriented. Mm -hmm. And one of the images that really stands out to me here, which I think would be another way of describing this engine, is in the undulations of the lake. So he has this uh, description, it's my page 85, where okay. he says, I would row out into the middle of the lake when it was calm and there stretching out full length in the boat and turning my eyes skyward, I let myself float and drift wherever the water took me, often for several hours on end, plunge into a host of vague yet delightful reveries. So I think that... I'm picturing the gentle rocking and drifting mm. of the mm. boat and the way that that echoes, or actually not echoes, going back to what we said before, actually catalyzes a gentle rocking of thought where you're lost in thought, but it's calm, peaceful. It's not like ruminating. It's Yes, it's not an active attempt at understanding and analyzing. And in fact, at, at one point he also says... It is a kind of thinking that happens while I am also forgetting. Yeah. So it's a forgetful thought. It's a kind of mental activity that happens in which you're not overburdened by memory. Okay. Uh, or by worries or by anxieties. Interesting. And so you can, you can almost think about it as a letting things fall away, letting a lot of the... The additional things that we carry because of life, because of stress, um, fall away. And then what remains maybe is the core of mm -hmm. our personality okay. or the core of our self. Um, and I don't know if you would describe that in terms of existence, in terms of maybe even almost like a natural feel of life, almost mm. in more biological terms. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, sentiment of existence certainly yeah. sounds like this. And this is, you know, yeah. pretty romantic in, in nature. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, towards the end of the essay, there was a, a place where I remember him talking about this. Um, and yeah, he says, set free from all the earthly passions that are born of the tumult of social life. My soul would often soar out of this atmosphere and would converse before its time with the celestial spirits whose number it hopes soon to swell. Mm. So it does have both this naturalistic, yeah. romantic, this naturalistic orientation. There's also a whole discussion here about plants and the kind of repose that he gets from going into the garden and studying plants. Yeah. So there's that naturalistic element, but also this romantic sense of a kind of transcendence in imminence yeah yeah okay. um, so it's not necessarily a transcendence where you leave the here and now in in a more traditional sense but it's almost as if you it's almost like a sense of unity mm -hmm. in existence maybe that's how i would think about it yeah and going back to the plants 
mention. Um, The plants plants mention. mention. That's a very weird way of putting it. (laughs) And then I want to ask you about forgetting. So one of the things that strikes me about this is that he says that it was much easier for this state of repose to come about on such a beautiful island in the middle of the lake in Switzerland. (laughs) But he doesn't think that you have to be in a beautiful setting in order for this state of repose to come about. It can, in principle come about anywhere it's just that it's easier for it to come about when your surroundings are conducive to it and I really resonate with that because I think there's a sense in which for me happiness and contentment are tied to surroundings but they're not entirely determined Determined by by them and I'm just talking about aesthetic surroundings here I think there are other external circumstances that can (laughs) catalyze or inhibit happiness but just in terms of beautiful surroundings but you mentioned this idea that there's a sort of forgetting that's going on um, Mm -hmm. in the piece that he's experiencing I wonder if you would see that as similar to the way that Nietzsche and Schopenhauer talk about forgetting because for them forgetting is necessary for health yeah, but it's also necessary for action. And yeah. I don't think here um, that the word action is exactly right. Okay. I think it's more of a letting go. Yeah. Um, it's more of a release, even from the demand to act, I yeah. think, for Rousseau. Okay. Um, and that image that you pointed to in the text of rowing and then just letting go of the, um, what are they called? The paddles? Yeah. They have the, the, um, the yeah, the rowing wooden sticks. The paddles. <laughs> yeah, okay, you, you paddles. <laughs> So I said um, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I thought you were being kind. I thought you were no, being no, kind. No, no, no. Um, and... I did have a moment of like, I think that's what they're called, right? But yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, so, right. but that image of rowing, letting go of the paddles, and uh, sort of giving yourself over to existence. Yeah. That's the kind of state that you can achieve through forgetfulness or through yeah. forgetting for Rousseau. And I think it's different than the than the upshot of forgetting okay, okay. for Nietzsche, which is about decisive action that affirms the self. Yeah. Here I, I see it much more as a more full participation in the moment and in the present. Okay. And through this kind of unity. Yeah, because it's almost like if there's any action in this it's just the action of reverie of being. and yeah. well of being but also okay. of reverie right like of, of being lost in thought and he says near the end that um you can add or he can add but i think we could generalize mm-hmm. it that he can add to his abstract reveries charming images that give them life so he can layer on to his train of thought charming images and so that's a form of mental activity that he's doing while just luxuriating in the bottom of the boat looking up at the sky that you're right is different from maybe what Nietzsche has in mind but I think also like that's kind of a cool idea to me this notion that participating in the act of dreaming daydreaming this is what this is all about right this is what it's about yes allows you to exercise I mean exercise your imagination right such that you're layering on these images and that's bringing you satisfaction it's almost like a giving yourself pleasure through something as simple as imagining a charming image no you're right it actually the text as a whole is written from the perspective um he's not saying like I am in this place right now experiencing this mm-hmm. he says I was there yeah I was in this island I had these experiences mankind or like social life he says drew me out of it by yeah. force yeah, yeah. but they cannot prevent me from going back to it through imagination exactly and and remembrance in this case so yeah. he's from this is written from the standpoint of remembrance totally um and so you have both the kind of reverie that you can do when you are in the moment and the reverie that you can do to bring yourself back to the moment even when you find yourself in a new reality mm. and that's the kind of mental escape or mental freedom um, and that that we see sort of enacted performatively yes. in the text. Yes, um, and- that's a great point. And I wonder another piece of this that I wonder about is the role of books here because yes. he says he left behind his yes. books and his uh, and his writing table. So he wasn't reading or writing. And just you know to to connect this to personal experience. Um, We love to get away and luxuriate on vacation, but 
I love to read when I'm on vacation. I don't necessarily love to write when I'm on vacation, and I definitely don't like to check email or be involved in like outer directed stuff. I don't really want to look at social media or like do public facing stuff while I'm on vacation. But reading is a pretty central part of my vacation. Vacations. <laughs> and when I'm thinking about like last summer when you and I were in France together, some of my favorite moments of that trip were sitting on the grass outside of the house where we were staying. And reading, reading Hegel. Yeah. And, uh, like, yeah, what, what do you think about this? He, Because he's like, no, I didn't have any books with me. I had no writing with me. Yes, and he says, um, he says, I took so much pleasure from, like, leaving them locked. Yeah. Um, but the thing, and this is where I actually thought about the books as the counterpart to the plans in okay. the text. Because when we think about books, we think about analytic mental activity. We think about interpretation, reading, uh, working with concepts, etc., and that's very different than the kind of activity that you do when you're just sort of meandering in nature. Yeah. But when he talks about approaching plants and uh, um, studying nature, he does so in an almost analytical manner. He talks about having a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. He describes it as the scale, um, as, uh, what's the term in, um, let me find it here. Yeah, uh, the, the sistema nature, um, again, oh, yeah. this, um, this, taxonomic classification of plants and animals rooted in the in the work of Linnaeus. Mm -hmm. So he is approaching nature with a still analytic eye, yeah. with the eye of taxonomy, but there is something about being in close communion with natural objects, like plants, that for him is fundamentally different than being in contact with these, let's say, cultural objects, yeah. like uh, books, even though it still allows you to, even though they, they still enable a kind of analytic thinking. Yeah. So he's not reading books, but he is reading the book of nature. True. But I think for him, that is not serious work. So it, it might be analytical in a sense, but he's he says it's not serious. So when he mentions the, the books and papers, like instead of all these gloomy old papers yes. and books, I filled my room with flowers and grasses for I was then in the first flush of enthusiasm for botany a taste soon to become a passion, which I owed to Dr. Divernois. I don't know who Dr. Divernois is, but we owe him a debt for, <laughs> for this material. Not wanting to spend the time on serious work, I needed some agreeable pastime, which would give me no more trouble than an idler likes to give himself. But so this is where I think you and I disagree on this text, because I do think that he is kind of serious about his botany in particular. He says not wanting to spend the time on serious work. I know, but then look at the description <laughs> of his work in botany. Also, he wrote a whole other book called Letters on, on, on botany. botany. On okay. bo botany? Yeah, it's botany. Okay, oh, no. you see? You see? You were being kind this time. <laughs> um, and then he says a couple of lines down where he's talking about the plants. Yeah. Um, in accordance with this noble plan about studying plants, every morning after breakfast, which we all took together, I would set out with a magnifying glass in my hand and my sistema nature under my arm to study one particular section of the island, which yeah. I had divided for this purpose into small squares, again, to classify and to order, intending to visit them all one after another in every season. So there's also a systematicity here. Mm -hmm. um, nothing could be more extraordinary than the raptures and ecstasies that I felt at every discovery I made about the structure and organization of plants. Yeah. So even though he it, it, he's still very serious about it. Yeah, but I think, you know, when he says he's not calling it, when he says it's not serious work to him, I think we need to take that seriously. <laughs> and here's, this is a pure speculation because I'm, I'm kind of applying it now to, to personal experience. Um, Classifying plants. But, no, <laughs> but... Uh, what I don't like to do when I'm in these peaceful states of repose is be oriented toward worldly concerns in the sense of like professional development, hustling, etc. Okay. I am down to hustle when I'm at home, you know, during for us like the academic year. But in those brief moments of vacation, I really just want to check out. And checking out for me doesn't necessarily mean not undertaking analytical pursuits. Like for me, the equivalent of doing the botany would be deciding to read the phenomenology of spirit on vacation, <laughs> which I think is a quite enjoyable task. And that's like a hardcore thing to do, right? It requires a lot of attention, but it's not, it's not work mm. in the sense of 
producing. So, so maybe yes. it's like a question yes. of productivity. I think that's right, because I want to say that there is a kind of seriousness to his approach to botany, um, uh, where he is thinking about it, he's planning for it, but it's clear that it's because the reason, the rationale behind it is because it brings him immense joy. Yeah. And that's just yeah, the particularity yeah. about Rousseau, that he was obsessed with plants. Yeah. Maybe for you, it's reading Hegel. Maybe for me, I don't know what it would be. Um, I, I would have like my own little pet hobby yeah. that just brings me a, a, a sense of un, uncontrollable joy, even if it doesn't translate into something actionable or something practical. But I yeah. think that would be a better, um, a better way to describe what sets it apart yeah um, yeah so one last thing i wanted to remind us of is the imagery of water in this text which is something that we talked about earlier hmm. he's on an island surrounded by water and a lot of the descriptions of happiness in this text have to do with water and with floating right I think there's so much to that metaphor here in the sense that periods of contentment do feel like they're carrying us along on a calm and pleasant drifting kind of current rather than a rush. Yeah. Um, and so there's this sense for me of being at my happiest moments or states, because he says it's a, a lasting state not being like pushed with this intense deluge of passion or need, but rather, and, and also not being entirely still, this goes yeah. back to something you said at the beginning, but rather coursing along in this like very leisurely type of way. Yeah, it's like floating. It's like, what is the term for when you like take um, a tire and you like r just like roll down the river? Oh, yes. As opposed to like quick water rafting. What? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, La I mean, it's like the lazy river yes, effect. Yes. Um, or kayaking rather than quick water. Tubing? Is it tubing? tubing? Yes, okay. it's tubing. <laughs> tubing rather than quick uh, water rafting. Yeah, people used to do that on the Chattahoochee River when we lived I used in Atlanta. To do it. I never did it. It was wonderful. Oh, sounds good. It beautiful. was my Rousseauian moment. Um, and, but <laughs> I was like a tubing in this very weird lazy river in Palm Springs last summer in 100 degree weather with my mom, <laughs> with like screaming children probably peeing in the lazy river the entire time. <laughs> It was, like, nice, but not that peaceful. So Chattahoochee sounds a lot nicer. So, yeah, but, like, the, the image of water, right, I think is really important because there is this movement rather than a push. But the thing about water, about using water as a metaphor, is that, as Heraclitus says, you know, you don't bathe in the same river twice. There's yeah. always a sense of the passing of water and time and, therefore, of loss. And so one one thread that I see it's flowing through. step in the through. same river twice, not yeah. bathe in the same well, well, river Well, you're twice. stepping in, you're bathing. Um, and, and so one theme that I see flowing through this reverie is actually, and that is not thematized very explicitly, is a sense of loss. Yeah. Um, especially because usually we, we have a reverie about past things that we have loved because they're not there anymore. And it means that this sense of contentment and happiness that he's describing has built within it a place for something like melancholia or regret mm -hmm. and in fact I'm, hmm. I'm, I'm looking at the very first sentence of the reverie um, the one that opens this fifth walk and he says of all the places where I have lived and I have lived in some charming ones none has made me so truly happy or left me such tender regrets as the island yeah. of Saint, of Saint, uh, Saint Pierre in the middle of the lake of Bien. Because he wanted to stay there, but he only ended up yeah. being there for a couple of months. And and as you mentioned, though, that then gives him all of this fodder for the imagination mm -hmm. such that he can return to it imaginatively yeah. wherever but, he lives. But I, I love that notion of a tender regret. Should we wrap up there? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, all. <laughs>